From the Oregon State University Extension Service, this is Pollination, a podcast that tells the stories of researchers, land managers, and concerned citizens making bold strides to improve the health of pollinators. I'm your host, Dr. Adoni Melithopoulos, Assistant Professor in Pollinator Health in the Department of Horticulture. A wonderful uh, side benefit of being a pollinator enthusiast are all the plants. There are so many of them, you could never exhaust your curiosity and interest in growing or looking for plants. It can also be a little bit daunting. How do you know how to set up a pollinator garden? And with that question in mind, the daunting and the excitement, I thought, well, there's no better person who embodies both of those then Al Shea. Al Shea is currently an instructor in the horticulture department here at OSU. He has an undergraduate degree in art as well as horticulture. And the nice thing about uh, Al is that he's been working in green industries for 38 years. So he has a big vision of uh, how to make um, you know, a specific garden really uh, boom with life, but also has a grander vision. So in this episode, we're going to uh, go through some books that Al Um, kind of his anchors for thinking about pollinator garden design. And then we're going to go through some plants, and then we're going to go through uh, some tips on how to save some money and get some really weird plants into your garden design. So without further ado, Al Shea, weird plants, weird books, all sorts of things this week on Pollination. It's just like Joe Rogan. It's fantastic. <laughs> kind of like Joe Rogan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just want the big cushy seats those guys are sitting in. Okay. Well, we don't have cushy seats. Welcome to Pollination again, uh, Al. It's uh, nice to see you, although virtually, which sucks. Yeah. Yeah. We were just discussing uh, what a long, um, strange trip it's been to uh, quote the Grateful Dead um, <laughs> after uh I don't know. What are we at? Eight, nine, ten. I mean, it's crazy. I showed up. True, uh, true story. I show, showed up at my dermatologist yesterday morning for my yearly uh, cancer screening, a skin cancer screening. It was the wrong day. It's the wrong date, rather. So I really. She says, "Oh, you're the second person this week who did it." Hey, everything's <laughs> hard, uh, everything hard, is upside down these days. Hard to keep track of things, but you know what? What is a constant amidst all this crisis? And that's nature. If you've been out in this out and about, you can see bulbs coming up, buds swelling, um, um, a mammoth species, witch hazel already flowering. Uh, I've got a beautiful, beautiful viburnum, a boden dense in my backyard now, feeding the uh, uh, native, well, native, not native bees, but honeybees. Um, so nature keeps moving on, and that is a constant that will remain with or without us. It's hard to uh, think of the world without human beings. Uh, unless you're into the natural sciences, and then then maybe you kind of yearn for less of us out there. <laughs> well, just kidding. Well, just, what, just kidding. Well, one um, of the things that we were talking about before was, you know, people are busy and active, especially under COVID. But one of the things that you know we, I've I noticed this time of year is people cleaning their gardens up. They're just going through, yeah. getting the leaf blower, yeah. kind of yeah. like making it look spotless, and ready for their annuals or the perennials to come in. And we were talking about that in terms of pollinator protection and that, you know, this may not be the best approach. You know, it's not. And if you just simply Google um, leaving your garden messy, um, you'll come up with with a couple of hits that that are worthwhile. And in preparation uh, for this little chat, rather than try to memorize everything, I downloaded an awful lot of information. So, um, yeah, uh, look, you know, I've spent. Uh, I spent 27 years in the field in totality. I have 40 years under my belt uh, in uh, horticulture. And, um, you know, I was pretty straight and narrow. I mean, I I just, and I still do embrace formality, whether it's a vision of Versailles or uh, any other Renaissance garden, that geometric sort of layout is still fascinating to me. I just don't think that we can condense something the size of the island of Manhattan, right, Versailles, into your own backyard, it doesn't always work. So from the design perspective, that's one element to consider, but more so, I'll use my own backyard as a reference because you know, having maintained sites of that nature for so many years, the last thing I wanted to do when I came home was be on a lawnmower, whether it's walking yeah. behind it or riding it. So I have no turf. Now, believe me, if you have a need for turf, by all means have some turf. I have no turf. 
on edging. I spent a lot of time edging, 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 delineating a bed from a sidewalk, delineating a bed from a turf area. Well, again, no turf, no pathways that differ in terms of the uh, surfacing than my beds. So I use wood chips, and that's my backyard. So our, uh, we're creatures of geometry. Our eyes are, are, are will always be drawn to a perimeter, to an edge. So I've kind of had that dissolve completely. The third thing, the big thing we're, we were talking about specifically is I just let everything sit there. And that's a hard one to swallow. I, I really understand that. Because we've all been programmed to be neat and clean. You should be able to perform minor sur- surgery in your backyard. It's okay if you can't do that. And leaves and debris. And I'll just, um, uh, I'll just read one little, little um, um, uh, paragraph here. Um, that talks about um, how many different things are overwintering. So many species of uh, native bumblebees, mason bees, leaf gutters, et cetera, use garden space over winter. Depending on the species, bees will take winter refuge under a pile of bark or dried leaves or nest in cavities and hollow cut out stems and decomposing logs. Wow, okay, so a couple of things going on there. One, we need to generate our ability to tolerate leaves. Brown is a color and it's okay. It provides a great insulating blanket. Again, you know, whether it's an assassin bug or a wolf spider um, or it's native uh, bumblebees, they can all find habitat under leaf litter, okay? Um, cutting things back in the habit of cutting everything back as soon as October gets here. Leave it. Leave it overwintering. All those spent flower heads, whether it's spirea or rudbeckia or echinacea or heliopsis, the perennial kind I really love, and that is sunflower, by the way, and, and of course, annual sunflowers as well. Just leave it. And I know it's tough to look at it sometimes. We think we're not doing our job. We are not fulfilling the mandate, the agreement with nature. Well, I'm here to tell you, nature <laughs> much prefers us to stand back, to stand back. Don't get so excited about it. As soon as we reach 50 degrees Fahrenheit, right? And why 50 degrees base Fahrenheit or 10 degrees Celsius? Because that's the signal to a lot of insects. Hey, time to get going. Time to get going. Okay. In springtime, that may not happen in our neck of the woods to the end of March, beginning of April. And then believe me, you know, I'm out there like everybody else cutting stuff back. I'm tired of looking at it as well, but I leave it all winter long. So please think about that. Get on along. Benefits of a messy garden, they'll come right, several sites will come right. One other thing I wanted to talk about real quick, Andoni, is some of the books I'm into, some of the points I made to Andoni is, you know, look, I could spout about this plant and that plant, and that's wonderful. Um, what do you leave with, though? Well, you leave with half a dozen plants. Let's make that a much bigger picture. So a uh, couple of things um, I like, and I'll just raise them up so you can see them, Andoni. Of course, our, our guests uh, can't. But, oh, yeah, um, but I, I'll just... Describe the yeah, wildflowers of the Pacific Northwest. You know, by, by Turner and and Gustafson. When I book, when I first book. got here, you told me to buy the book. Oh, and cool. I did. Cool. And it, it's so worth it. It's so it's Absolutely. got it's got everything in it. You, uh, um, uh, and we will have these all in the show notes as well for people. But what do you find? What what do you use that book for? So what's that book do for you? That, what that book does, and we'll get to exotics versus versus natives. It's a really great resource for all the natives. And what's really cool about it, if it's if it's found, you know, within the Northwest, Washington, our 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 clip of the Northwest or our reach of the Northwest anyway, Washington to Oregon, um, it's going to be in the book. And they'll say non-native. Right? I was looking at whorehound, merubium, one of my favorite Mediterranean plants for drought tolerant gardens. It's like, what are you doing here? And it says non-native. So you you can determine what is found here, and that right off the bat gives you that it may not be native, but it's become naturalized. What does that mean? It means it's adapted to our, our climatic conditions and can function as, as well as a native can, okay? Mm-hmm. But we'll talk more about natives and exotics. Um, yeah, I want to uh, just wait on these two because they're super good. But um, The Well-Tended Perennial Garden by Tracy DiCipato Ost. The Well-Tended Perennial Garden. Garden. Now, what this book does, what Tracy does, is she'll she'll take there's a lot of overview how to divide plants, the compost, this that the other thing, wide array of different gardening topics that are covered, and then it just breaks out into the encyclopedic uh, component, and she goes through all these plants. Now, what's the benefit? Well, look, 
We're not growing a meadow, a native meadow. And in that, the competitive elements would be such that plants would do a lot of things they don't do when we try to cultivate them, all right? Because we are, we shouldn't, but we are fertilizing, usually overwatering, okay? And creating an environment where which they can grow with a level of lushness and exuberance that wouldn't be found in nature, in a natural setting. So what do we do? Tracy tells me how to deal with these plants. If it's a, um, um, if it's a, a, a bee bomb, for instance, okay? Um, you should pinch that back in the middle of June. If it's a giant seven-foot heliopsis, beautiful sunflower smothered with native pollinators, you know, from two millimeters up to 15 millimeters, and uh, Apis mellifera, our, our honeybee. Um, hey, but at seven feet, that falls over. That ruins the appeal for the homeowner. What do I do? Well, she very clearly tells you, you should cut that in half about uh-huh. midway through June, and then you'll have a five-foot plant rather than seven so that advice is just invaluable so let me get this straight so she's kind of goes through and she's just got little tidbits like open the book i want to see a page what yeah, sure. how does she how does she do this sounds this i need this book well no you definitely should have it let me let me get to e f g h h h i g g h i oh so it's, al- it's alphabetically ordered it, it is alphabetical and ah. if you remember the alphabet uh, that's great. I don't often do that. So here I am, uh, Helianthus salicifolius. So most of them uh, have a picture. Okay. And so then there's a sequence of pros, and here's how it breaks out. Um, uh, the name, uh, a botanical name, Helianthus salicifolius. Will we f- sunflower is in the com- composite family, golden yellow, daisy-like flowers, five to six feet in height. Right off the bat, you know, hmm, that could be challenging. Full sun blooms late September to October. Very handy. Zones four to nine, well within our zone. Pruning. If plants are grown in full sun, the stems are usually self-supporting. If given shade or overly rich soil, plants will be more open, taller, and weaker, requiring staking. Pinching or cutting back creates more compact growth. Plants in full sun that normally reach four to five feet may grow to only about three feet if they're cut back at the appropriate time of the year. Then she has other maintenance, then related plants. Um, um, uh, so now she's going through cultivars, and I'll talk about cultivars in a minute. Helianthus salicifolius lowdown is so small that it seems like another species entirely. So it'll broaden your scope huh. in terms of um, going from species, which I'm very fond of, and we'll talk about that in a moment, to, oh, well, you know, maybe I'll try a cultivar. Okay, so, so the book is organized by plant. So you open it up to a page, right. you read, and it tells you some tricks about it, but it also says, hey, you may want to consider here's some – these are the same plant, but here's some sure. different cultivars. Sure. I gotcha. Sounds good. And, awesome. and again, prior to that component, it's all how do how do I garden? How do I divide plants? You know, what what, what tools are good? What spading fork to use? What do I cut back? What do I pinch back? Oh, what I need this book. Do I do it? It's critical. I use Jeez. it in my herbaceous perennials class. Well worth the space on anyone's bookshelf. Oh, uh, great. The next one, which is a little bit more of a heady read, uh, planting in a post wild world. And um, they really get down to the nitty gritty of taking an ecosystem approach. Again, you can use native plants or uh, construct your own sort of uh, um, palette of plants that are well adapted to your region. And uh, I'm not going to go into that. They've got several principles I jotted down. I don't want to talk about that. Wait a sec. Post wild means how you kind of create something kind of wild after the fact. Is that what it is? (laughs) Right on. And let, <laughs> okay. let me just thank, thank you. Um, if, if you, if you, um, if you Google messy ecosystems, yeah. orderly frames, the uh, landscape architect behind all this is Joan Nasser, N-A-S-S-A-U-E-R. It's a great read on how, on how to combine a construct that gives us some sense of that orderliness. Yeah. It allows us to get a little wild. We cannot tolerate an unmanaged site. Okay. We're, we're like, uh, we're like a border collie. We're, we're herding <laughs> dogs at our heart and, and any more, and don't, you know, any more when I'm, when I'm talking with a, a private client, um, it's very important when I'm done with the project, we got the drought tolerant beds installed and pollinator plants and, you know, one thing after the other, I, I write out, I no longer say, do not water. There's no way people are not going to water. Mm-hmm. Because they look at you and go, 
How are they going to live? Well, they don't need water. How are they going to live? Well, they don't need water. How are they going to live? All right, great. I give up. So now I look, <laughs> I look for plants that exhibit a level of plasticity uh-huh. where they can tolerate some water. Then I make sure I burn. And I mean, this discussion can go on for hours in a wide array of different directions. I'll try to keep it rather concise. I burn up. Sometimes I plant in straight rock. Rock. Okay, to give you the drainage I need if I'm using a wide array of eastern Oregon plants. How are they going to make it through a wet winter? Not a problem. It's Ah. cold, often snowy over there. So they do get precipitation in the form of snow, but they need impeccable drainage. So then when I'm writing out, hey, here's how you're pruning that plant. Here's do not use synthetic fertilizer. Whatever I'm telling them, I'll, I'll specifically write, you must, you must irrigate twice a month. Don't, can you do that? Yeah, I can do that. And they're, they're, they're satisfied. They've got a regime. But that twice a month versus watering every day is now taking a monthly irrigation cycle that requires two, two irrigation periods versus 20. Did we, is that sustainable? It really is. Yeah, yeah. Not that you can't go crazy and go, no, I, I don't want to water at all. Fine. There are plenty of plants that don't need water at all. A lot of people are into meadows right now. Well, what's a grass alternative? Um, if you haven't heard of John Greenlee, he's the American meadow garden guru. Oh, what a beautiful cover. Oh, stunning. Saxton Holt, phenomenal pho- photographer. And, huh. and I, I met this guy. We kind of hit it off, and he graciously allowed me to use all the photographs out of the book for my herbaceous premise. Oh, I, I, I teach an entire module just on meadow garden. Now, if you're hip to what a meadow is, uh, you know, it's, it's more grass, sedge, and um, rush than it is um, uh, uh, her- herbaceous flowering elements, but there's plenty of those in there as well. So it gives you great resources. If you say, hey, I, I don't know what to do. I don't want turf. You know, I, I just don't want a bunch of plants out here. What do I do? And you go from mowing, you know, twice a week to once a year, and you have a phenomenal show, and it's, it's, it's less input. It's less input. Our industry revolves around inputs. Because if people aren't inputting, they're not getting paid for the activity. So it's a whole different mind shift that we need to embrace now. And it's something I continually struggle with. I've got a lot of friends in the industry that are on, are on straight and narrow. They've got a maintenance company, a construction company, you know, the maintenance company. I don't care if you need it to be sprayed or mowed or edged. We're doing it every week. Or we're not, I can't pay my, 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 my staff. So it's a huge challenge that the industry is facing. Okay. I don't want to get too caught up in this, but two more. I'm sure you've seen these Andoni pollinators oh. of native plants. Spectacular. And and of course, it covers the whole country, but there are handy dandy maps in there, and they'll show you where the plant is typically found, bearing in mind that we live in the Willamette Valley, and other than cotton and peanuts, we could pretty much grow anything. And the one I really got two weeks ago when we talked about doing this, and I just find it fabulous right now, and I can't recommend it highly enough for everybody, is the 100 Plants to Feed the Bees by the Xerces Society. Oh, it's great. And it, it reminds is, me, yeah. It's go. just fantastic. Mm-hmm. And simple is good. Simple is good. We don't need to make make things so complex that we can't wrap our head around it unless you're a PhD candidate in in ecology or entomology or horticulture. We want, for me anymore, if if I'm not connecting with the average homeowner, the average citizen, and making them a better gardener, I haven't succeeded. It doesn't matter what my yard looks like or all my buddies' yards. We're all crazy about plants and ecology and everything else. I want to bring this to the average homeowner. Okay, so here, here. Um, I, I do want to talk just briefly about um, about natives versus exotics. Yeah, I, mean, I just... want to I want to I want to talk to you about that oh, because it, it just it just seems like um, you know I, I was just talking to cherry growers uh, this morning right. and it came up and it's like well you know it, uh, there is a way in which uh, nat- native bees do go to exotic plants like they're in um, the corolla is the same length that pones out the nectar. Um, you know, when it comes to bee conservation, it strikes me that um, they can go together. But you do. Um, but we we did have Linda Hardison on the show the other day, and I could, I totally understand there's a place for people who just love seeing native plants and learning how to grow them. So, but it seems like it just gets it's a heated argument. It can turn into a heated argument. And what's the sensible way to kind of go through this uh, a native versus exotic controversy? Yeah, um, I, I've you know I've read. Uh, um, Doug Talamay's books. Uh, one I'm reading now is No Nettles Required, where he kind of refutes all of that. It's out of England. 
of course. And, you know, uh, since they are the, for, for the people in the West, like us, they are the world's leading gardening culture, having been at it actively for a thousand years, a millennium. Um, so it does go both ways. Uh, uh, let's, let's, let's step it back a moment and go, what should I use? Well, for goodness sakes, always start with native plants. Always start with native plants. And thinking of this, I, I'm, I'm kind of laughing because I live in the bottomland area, okay? And I'm looking, hmm, okay, so, you know, I, I fully embrace, don't change the site to fit the plants. Use plants that fit the site. Yeah, yeah. That's being sensible. Okay. So here I have, I have a um, rubus, a uh, leucodermis, uh, no, or sinus, okay? It's a little trailing dewberry. Very pretty plant, wonderful little fruit about the size of maybe your pinky nail. Well, I should have paid more attention to the common name, devil's shoelaces, <laughs> right? 25 years ago, it's still not gone. It's uh-huh. still not completely gone. I have it under control, though, okay? I went ahead and planted a scurpus, which is a rush, to try to take over my backyard. <laughs> Paraculum linatum, cow parsnip, one of my favorite plants in nature. Big, humble, you know, beautiful, uh, attractive to wide array of pollinators, is a beast. It'll start to seed and go everywhere. What's my point? Many of our native plants are incredible weeds. Not so much so the uh, deciduous ones, but certainly the shrubs. If you if you align them with the appropriate uh, habitat, in my case, relatively moist. Um, oh my gosh. So be cautious. But I always start with native plants. And when I was an undergrad in the 80s here at Oregon State University, our design uh, teacher, a landscape architect by the name of John Stewart, still at it locally here in town, probably in his late 70s by now. Um, and of course, pre-internet. So we had this huge four by eight piece of plywood that John stacked, you know, two or three feet high with catalogs. And we could not spec a plant because we liked the plant. We could only spec it if we could find it in a catalog. Of course, all <laughs> that's done online today. Oh, okay, great. So what do you think of the um, availability of native plants were here in the Lamont Valley in the mid eighties? Big fat next to zero. Yeah. ODOT was probably the biggest user of native plants. If you wanted uh, a vaccinium ovatum, our evergreen huckleberry, one of my favorite Everyone should have this native plant in their yard uh, uh, selections, um, along with things like, you know, ribes, you know, flowering currant. Everybody should have that native, if you love natives or not. Um, you would have to order it three years in advance. Not so now. Wow. But, yeah, crazy. Just crazy yeah. stuff to think now. Um, and now, now we look at it and it's like, oh, my God, oh, do we have enough native nurseries? So they're abundant. And, of course, me, I'm spoiled. I buy wholesale, so it's relatively inexpensive. I always start with a native palette as the platform. But as a buddy of mine likes to say, look, um, if you're a meat eater and eat steak every night, and now you're on a road trip and you don't get a hamburger, can you survive? Well, of course you can. Uh, I can't. I never remember the exact title of the book, but it's We Are Not Intelligent Enough to Determine the Intelligence of Other Fauna. And we're not. We're just beginning. Any ecologist will tell you we're just beginning to understand the interplay between uh, soil uh, my, micro, microbes and plants and how that extends beyond that to the aerial faunal components that they interact with. Uh, anyway, I don't want to get going on that. It gets me way excited and crazy. So uh, by all means, start with, with natives. But if you're living in a semi-urban or urban space, it's no longer native. The pH has changed, drainage has changed, the humidity has changed, microclimate has changed. In New York City, in, in Manhattan, okay, that's what we call New York City itself, they use a lot of trees from the, uh, the southeast because the humidity now that's been created by these concrete canyons is not native. You can't use too many natives under those highly altered situations. People in my industry whine to me continually about the city of Portland demanding X number of natives per square meter um, if you're doing any sort of project in the city. And it's like, well, okay, but um, we can try. And believe me, I've got my own own catalog of native plants that I wouldn't plant without. But I have mixed plants that are non-native. The, the problem is there's never any citation as to 
uh, on exotic plants ability to withstand drought that I've seen. So things like um, uh, Pinus mugo mugo, uh, Euonymus fortunii, okay, um, Calwitzia, an old time grandma, grandpa plant beauty bush. I have planted all of those in hedgerows with native flora that have received zero water after the second year. My mm-hmm. student worker and I would go out there and we'd, we'd water, we'd hand can with mycorrhizal fungi and water them for the first two years. But after that, no moss, we're just not doing it anymore. And uh, everything holds up beautifully. You know, right along a whole slew of other, you know, um, natives such as Ribe sanguinium, holodiscus, ocean spray is one of my favorites. Of course, Mahoney aquifolium, our native Oregon grape, does a great job in a, um, uh, a hedgerow and also supplies a fair amount of floral uh, nectar and pollen for plants. Um, you know, another thing I came across before I forget, it's not herbaceous perennials, we'll, we'll get to those, but um, the use of um, dioecious plants. So when we say mani, it's just that in, in Latin means of one house. So mm-hmm. you have male and female on the same plant. And sometimes it's actually the same flower. flower yeah. Okay. Now, if we say mani, it just means, well, we need a pollinator. Everybody knows holly, right? Holly. Okay. So you're not going to get the berries unless for every six females or so you have a male. But here's the thing about males, and I never realized that until I, I read this article about two years ago is that the males, of course, are producing pollen. Mm -hmm. And they flower early. They flower early. So here's an opportunity to supply much, much needed uh, uh, protein, right? Protein uh, is, is, pollen is the protein source for our native bees and honeybees. And then, of course, nectar is the ready carbohydrates. And, of course, it's also fed to um, larvae as well. But, um, wow, okay, so plant more more of the males we really don't care about typically because they don't produce the fruit. But, you know, you have holly, you have sumac, you have lindera spice, spice bush and several others that are monoecious. So when you're doing the planting out, you know what? If you have six of the fruit bearing females, put in three males. You only need one, but put in three males. That's just a side note entirely. Um, Anyhow, um, boy, I'm looking over my notes here real quick. And I think I've covered uh, 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 most of what we wanted to talk about. Um, Well, you know, you know what? Uh, Al, I think this is a a great moment to just, we'll take a quick break. Let's regroup because I I, I know I could keep you going for as long as you have time for, which I think our, uh, our listeners would like. So let's take a quick break. We'll be back in just a second. Sounds great. Okay, we are back. So we wanted to talk a little bit about um, some of the, the annuals, but I, you know, one of the things that we were talking about before we even got started was you were saying, you know, a lot of these plants, the plants that are kind of um, you can't really get at the nurseries, or, or if you can, they're expensive. You can typically get a seed, but absolutely, the, but um, but seeds are complicated. So how can you get some of these cool plants? Awesome. Without awesome. having to like yeah. sink yeah. all this money or travel to the mm-hmm. high end of somewhere or someone's yeah. plant sale. Yeah. So, so, so here's the deal, folks. Um, you know, um, I'm a plant nut like a- a- anybody else. And when uh, no, 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 you're not a plant le- nut like anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm extreme to the max. But um, you know, I just received you know my little uh, catalog from Bluestone Perennials. I'm looking through it. I saw a wonderful Veronica I have to have. And certainly there are a lot, a lot of things that are cultivars you can't really duplicate very easily. But when I think of pollinators, I think of what? Well, you have Coreopsis, you have Gallardia, you have Echinacea, you have Liatris, Blazing Star. Those are four big hitters. And you know what? $2.79 will easily get you enough seed to do an entire flat. And we do our flats in what we call a 1020 flat, holds 18 four-inch containers. Oh, wow, I don't have a greenhouse cell. Exactly. So here's what you do. You don't try to do this in February. You do it in the middle of June when things have warmed up. Find a spot in your yard, and if it gets automatic irrigation, even better. That gets at least some partial shade, but things don't dry out too quickly. And then buy your packets of seed. It'll be under 15 bucks for the seed. 
for a, a packet for the, the big four I just listed. You're going to have to pay a little bit more to get your uh, four-inch pots, your, your flats, and your media. But after year one, you will never pay again for the flats or the pots, okay? okay? Just your media. You get your media in there. You, you pack it down a little bit. What I like to do is I'll fill one uh, four-inch container first, and then I use that to compact the other containers. Just get get the air out of that. Okay. Lay, lay them out. Broadcast your seed. Okay. And for these four elements, they do not need to go through a winter chilling period. That can be a challenge. I'll talk more about, about that in a minute, but not an issue here. Get those flats laid out. Maybe you want to do two flats of each. So you'll have 36 of each. Okay. For two or three or four dollars and 79 cents. Holy cow, that doesn't come out to much per unit, does it? No. Cover it with hardware cloth. Again, you'll have to pay up front for year one, but then you have it. The hardware cloth is meant to keep out the Blue Jays, all of our other avifauna, and and rodents. They love seed, and we'll go through that um, in nothing flat, so make sure you protect it. And you can just lay it out. You can wrap it around the flats if you like. What we do is we buy, uh, a, a, a not hardware cloth, a finer screen. What you use, metal, not, not nylon, but metal screen replacement if you want to redo a screen. And then we can bring it down the sides of the flats. We put steel pipe on top of that, maybe some bricks in the corners, and you're done. You're done. As soon as things germinate and they start to bust up to the point where you need to take it off, take it off. They're not going to be prey to uh, the uh, the predation we just talked about. Uh, once they're they've uh, you know uh, are are fully foliated, green, and growing, and then you need to be really cautious as you get into August because that container is going to get filled with roots pretty quick, really quick, and it's going to uh, uh, pull that moisture out of that the plant is. Uh, more rapidly at the end of August than it did in uh, the end of June. So uh, uh, September, October comes around, you're ready to plant. Fall is a great time to plant for uh, with perennials because the uh, soil temperatures are still in that 50 degree range and they will put on a lot of root growth. By next spring, it'll knock your socks off. If you're doing a meadow even, it's a great way to do the meadow. Why, you may uh, ask. Well, let's talk about that. We'll move on to the next list. And right here is a list of product I use uh, that comes from the eminent uh, biologist, Linda Boyer, who runs the seed component of Heritage Seedlings. And, don't, do and don't miss the episode with her. We have an episode back with Linda was talking just about uh, and, yeah, and we plant her seed all the time, her rough and ready pollinator mix. My God, it's it's there you go. Mine is tough, tough and tenacious. She's tough and really tenacious, nice. that's the one. <laughs> you really have to go through, and I'll talk about that in a moment, too. Um, so we get that from Linda, and I buy a pound, and that'll get us to almost 20 flats. 20 flats. That's, that's 364-inch containers. Well, they need to be vernalized, okay? And what that means is they need to be chilled through the winter to stimulate germination come spring. Not all the components, but a portion of them do. Those that don't, they germinate immediately in September when we first lay it out. And it's like, oh, yeah, cool. So we can look at it and see our little green carpet. And then we know by uh, March, well, actually, I'll be planning it out probably the middle of February. Um, and uh, just a mind blower. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, we, uh, we will get those out in February. Everything that needed a little bit more time to germinate has germinated or is still in that four-inch pot. And then I'll plant it out in, in, in my side. So you may ask, it's a lot of work, Al. What's just broadcast seed in fall? It's a great question. And when Linda is selling these to individuals who are doing restoration work, well, by golly, that's what they're doing. They're doing acres and acres. I'm doing, you know, 500 to 1,000 square foot plots. Well, here's the reason why. One, um, there's usually a barrier between the seed and the soil. And to get good germination, you have to have seed to soil contact. So on the OSU campus, for instance, it's all wood chipped. It's all wood chip, not going to work. The other is predation, mice, rats, right? Rodents in general. And then avifauna will just strip an area clean. They need to survive all winter long, and there's not a lot out there. And seeds are just a protein packed resource that, that they're not going to pass up. So we short circuit all of those negative uh, probabilities by. I, I'm just envisioning my little can yard at my research facility. Everything is neat, fully protected from predation, looking great. Another 
two or three weeks, we're going to start planting it out. So that is a great homeowner way to do things. And you, of course, can do the same thing. Well, how do I buy seed? Um, I bet you if you contacted Linda Boyer, okay, and made the minimum purchase, it's about $140 to $150 for a pound of seed, and got together with your neighbors, because you probably don't need 20 flats, um, away you go. Also, interestingly enough, uh, local nurseries, I'm thinking of one right near me, because uh, I live in Philomath, Chenard's, sells native seed. Wow. Absolutely. Okay, so I have Pletritis congesta sea blush, which I need to get out very soon. And I just bought a couple little packets of it, and away you go. So it couldn't be easier to do that. Um uh, right now compared to the way it was, again, when I was a student, not really, you know, uh, that available. So, look, uh, what what I get in Linda's mix, tough and tenacious, we have Achillea, a, a which is yarrow, Amsnickia, don't know the common name for that offhand, Aquilegia, which is Columbine, Clarkia, common name is also Clarkia, a couple of different Clarkias, Amania, Purpurea, Rhomboidea, Colinsia, and Colomia are two beautiful uh, Blue-eyed Mary is what Kalinzi is, and Colomia. Uh, Chinese lanterns, I think, is a common name. Both are annuals, but seed, reseed. They're perennial by seeding, is what we say, okay? Uh, uh, Ariophyllum, Oregon sunshine, beautiful plant, um, perennial, and it'll make it through season to season. Uh, GM, uh, Macrophyllum, or native GM, absolute weed, but I love it to death, so I just continually pick it out where I don't want it, and I try not to let it go to seed, but manageable, manageable in a backyard. Augusticum apiifolium, it's a, it's in the carrot family, beautiful plant, really attracts um, pollinators. I unfortunately have never <laughs> seen it germinate successfully out of this mix, but we keep trying. A couple of lomatiums, uh, lotus, a uh, phacelia, heterophila is our native phacelia. Um, it puts on a beautiful blue flower. A phacelia tenacidifolia is one that's used as a pollinator crop in Europe. And you can get that seed on Amazon. I've done it. Um, so that's just great to have around. Prunella um, opotentia, again, is just beautiful. That's, that's a little bit woodier. Uh, but uh, definitely is a perennial. Prunella vulgaris, also a perennial. It's a weed. We don't pay much attention to it. Its common name is heal all. Beautiful square stem and a uh, cluster of flowers on top of that square stem that pollinators just go crazy for. Ranunculus, a buttercup, well worth it. Rumex salicifolius. Um, it's kind of a, a little bit of a, a weed. Uh, my wife detests it. I kind of think it's cool. Uh, Salicifolius refers to the fact that the, the leaf resembles that of a willow, which is in the Salix genera. Sangusorba, Sudalciae, um, is wonderful, campestrous. Sudalciae, Malvaflorus subspecies, Vergata, is supposed to be what we're growing uh, for um, a Fender's Blue. Uh, here in Benton County. So I got chewed out for not growing that one. It's in the mix. Now, you need to be cautious. Uh, initially in our mix, we had a couple of the other elements. One was tarweed, um, which um, puts on a great show, but unfortunately it is an ugly, ugly plant. So again, we come back to how do we, how do we take this, this messiness and create an orderly frame that I can market to the black clad hipsters in Portland, for instance. <laughs> right? And we're going to talk more about that, that in a moment too, because it's another aspect of, of natives versus exotics. Go ahead. Andy. Well, the one thing I was going to mention is also for those of you who are in Southern Oregon, we did have uh, Susie Savo uh, from um, climate Siskiyou native seeds is another great source of seeds. If you're down, uh, down in the yeah. Southern, Southern part of the state. Okay. Keep going. Yeah, I mean, we're so spoiled here in the Lamont Valley and in, in, in the Applegate Valley as well down south. Lots of great seed houses selling a wide array of well-adapted, you know, vegetables to um, to wildfire. So we really are lucky from, from, from that end. So um, uh, Maddie Elegans is what tarweed is, and um, it has this um, habit that's referred to as vespertine. 
referring to evening vespers, right? So they Latinize that. And what it means simply is in the cool of the evening <laughs> and the cool of the morning, the flowers are open, but they're not in the heat of the day. <laughs> So when, when we had a hort garden by quarterly, and again, yeah, I love that shrug because you're right, Andoni. If you're doing a bigger area, it's not right outside your back window. Who cares? Use it. But if you're doing an area where you want to make sure every single element kind of shines, um, and I don't care about things turning brown so much, but this thing was about four feet tall and brown. And uh, I guess what tipped the balance for me is my wife was picking me up for lunch one day. And when court, you could drive into the quarterly hall um, parking lot, you can't now because they're redoing the entire hall. They tore out the entire hort garden, but we had a little plot of native el- elements there. And uh, uh, Maddie was one of them. She looked at me and says, what is that piece of garbage growing over there? <laughs> Do you really want that in there? And I, I, of course I, you know, I had to defend Maddie. It's a wonderful plan, but she was right. In that context, it made no sense. It was literally right in your face, brown, four feet tall. So going back to just um, for a moment with the exotics versus natives, all of our natives, as you can well imagine, come on early, just like my matrix does in this four inch pots. It comes on early. Why? Because we live in a summer dry region. We used to call it Mediterranean. Now to be more generic, we refer to it simply as summer dry. Or you can still call it Mediterranean. Nobody's going to arrest you. So what do you think our native flowering elements look like by the 1st of August? Well, they're all brown. They're all done. Maybe you've got a little bit of beat-up Gallardia coreopsis laying around whose leaves are torched. So, again, how do I sell this to the general public? That's where a mix of natives and and regionally adapted non-native plants really pay off. And, indeed, you know, I'm looking at this book. Uh, the um, Feed the Bees, 100, 100 Plants to Feed the Bees uh, by Xerxes. And they go on, you know, in the beginning about the benefit of native plants. And then they get into the encyclopedia where maybe only a third of the plants are natives. Because they know full well you can't keep a, a well-stocked buffet for native pollinators from, you know, April through October. You just can't. Um, and then if you want to use some of our native Symphio uh, trichum, our native aster, they had to change the name from aster to Symphio trichum for me. So I had to remember, memorize that. I finally did. <laughs> um, oh, my God. The glossia and some of these other species are absolute thugs. Thugs. Yeah, they, they will take over part of your garden space. They will. Now, if you're ready for that and have a big enough space, fine. If you've got smaller, more concise areas like where my wife gets out of her her, her, her minivan, uh-uh, that thing has to go. Um, but th- speaking of, of asters, um, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about them in a minute and what Trace has to say about that. Uh, uh, okay, I don't want to go on forever. Um, uh, just one quick uh, nod to annuals. Um, I, I passed on a, a um, presentation by a a uh, graduate student from Penn State, Andoni and Gail Angoletto, yesterday, and it covered. They did some trials and want to see what was more effective uh, than another. But uh, a list I just got off the internet: uh, Ajirdum, uh, Salvia guarnitica, and anise scented sage, any aster. Uh, but this is not the aster you're thinking of. This is Glustophus chinensis, Chinese aster, uh, black-eyed Susan rutabecchia. Salvia in general is just a great plant for pollinators. Borage, uh, Borago officinalis drives bumblebees crazy. It is a little bit of a weed, so you got to be able to tolerate that. Uh, Clary sage is great. Common lantana, that's a real East Coast annual that's finally making its way out here. That along with Pentis. Oh, yeah, it's on the list too. Uh, East Coast annuals used for. Decades, finally made it out here within the last five years or so. Uh, Cornflower centuria, be cautious, you you know, because it can get weedy. And then when you're looking at the more evolved or hybridized cultivars that don't that don't spread from seed, well, do they have the pollen and nectar for the natives you're trying to? I've been in just so many, so many natural areas in eastern Oregon where it just gets away. I just don't want to recommend it anymore. It just don't do it then. Okay. It's too weedy. Thank you. Thank you for that. Cause that's a yeah. great, it's, it's a regional thing. Everybody loves it, but it just, it, it gets out there and then it just, it, it just kind of takes a meadow and dominates it. Yeah. Yeah. And I see, I see alerts about things like Berberus, Barberry. Don't use it. It's a weed. Uh, Norway maple, um, you know, uh, whether you like Norway maple or not, you know, uh, some of our uh, flowering pears are taking over entire forests. 
back east, we don't have that problem in the valley. Uh-huh. Okay, Eliagnus, uh, it's it's an olive of, of sorts. Um, you know, I had a a, a, a naturalist. I said, "Oh my God, you plant that stuff out here? It doesn't take over." I go, "No, I've never seen it escape. A barberry, never seen it escape. Things like a Tony Aster, uh, Firethorn, yeah, they can get into the, our native uh, ecosystem. Uh, Heterohelix, ivy, it's a great source of nectar for pollinators, but it's absolutely dominating in an ecosystem. So exercise caution. Yeah. Um, Pentas, pineapple, sage, popcorn, plant, cassia, I'm not even familiar with this one, the Didymo bot, Botria, snapdragon, one of my favorites, Interim. Um, I don't go for the mix. I go for black prints, beautiful, deep maroon foliage and flowers, just stunning plant, great in containers. Um, spider flower, clam, Cleome, sweet William, sweet Alyssum, Tithonia, man, I'm glad that made it on the list. Mexican sunflower, Tithonia rotundifolia, ugh. In, you know, just, they, we they were crazy. we were looking for a plant for you know that we have that new publication out. We were looking for a plant. You know, uh, Amy Jo Detweiler was looking for a, a good plant for a late summer kind of uh, aster, and that came up. And I I was researching it at the time, and it looks like a great plant. Yeah, stunning plant. Yeah, make it all all all, all, all the way to frost. Um, I use that as part of my uh, south of the border collection. So, for instance, I, I use Zinnia elegans a lot. Because that's the old species. I'll use that with uh, Tegetti's, which is marigold. Uh, and I try to hunt down ones that are, are um, f- uh, comfortable or appealing to our, our pollinators. And then helianthus. All of those plants, you know, our, our annual sunflower, are typically found south of the border. And um, they hold up well. They don't need a whole lot of water. The pollinators go for ber- or berserk for them. And that was the last one on the list there, Zinnia, after Verbena bonariensis. And I don't know where you'd think of Verbena bonariensis as an annual. Uh, it's herbaceous perennial in my my book, but uh, it's neither here nor there. So don't give up on annuals. Just again, Google annuals for um, for pollinators. Okay, I've got a list, uh, Andoni, of just a few plants. If you want to, uh, I can go through those, and then um, we yeah. can see what other, other thoughts you have. So again, I'm focusing mostly on herbaceous perennials. Um, so the, the, these are just, these are these are what are these plants? These are your you know, um, look, uh, and Donnie said, hey, let's hear about some super special plants. Super okay, special again, plants. Super special is what? Highly cultivated that have no appeal uh, for pollinators. A uh, highly cultivated and that. No, that no, no. This is, is this, this is Al's list. Well, it's a quick list. But again, you know, okay. I'm looking at this Bluestone catalog. It's 1450 for a little half quart container. Now, how many ordinary people are going to pay that kind of money? All right, but we're, at the, we're near the end of the interview, so we can go to the weird ones. Oh, there you go. Okay, so listen, I picked some unusual ones and some common ones. Asters, okay. you know, New England aster, uh, New York aster are great. Uh, they went from aster again to symphio tritum. The beauty of them is they're late flowering. Um, uh, if you look in Tracy's book, she exhorts you to go ahead and cut them back by half in June. Really? Otherwise, you're going to have a four-foot plant that's going to flop over come September, and we don't want that. Yeah, okay. Um, Boltonia. Asteroides, okay, is another plant, and um, hmm, I'm not sure what the common name is for that. Snowbank is a cultivar, and I think that cultivar is pretty close to the species, so I wouldn't hesitate to plant it either. Again, it's kind of a bushy, more woody uh, perennial um, uh, with daisy-like flowers late late in the season. Don't expect to see that until um, <laughs> until uh, uh, you know August. I'm just shuffling because August. You know, pardon me. August. August. Oh, yeah, it's late. Right. I'm just stuck because on that annuals list, they had uh, pineapple, sage, salvia elegans. And if you ever grown this marvelous plant, but it doesn't start to flower until September. <laughs> so if you do use that, put it against the wall that's south facing, give it a lot of heat. It'll probably come on a little earlier than that. Um, bee balm, Minarda, everybody wants that. How do they not plant the uh, yeah, bee balm? So uh, if you Google um, um, mildew resistant, Monarder or mildew resistant bee bomb, you'll get the same list that came out of Chicago Botanical Garden that raced them uh, to their resistance to mildew, which is a big issue. Okay. Uh, the other aspect of uh, Monarder, they too can get kind of lax and falling apart. Look in Tracy's book because I know you're all going to buy it and she'll advise you how to pinch those back or just shear them back again in June before things have begun to flower and away you go. Agostica funiculum, this is a nice hyssop. Smells like licorice, phenomenal plant. 
Uh, you can cut back in spring. It gets about waist high. Marvelous. And <laughs> it's a crazy looking plant. It is a crazy looking plant. I, you know, she's talking about maintenance, and I think the picture in her book is like, oh my God, looks like about 500 square feet of this plant. I mean, who would be, you know, doing too much to that plant? It just gets a little bit out of hand. But if you have one or two plants, you can whack them back to six inches early in the spring and they'll take off. One of my favorites is Heliopsis helianthoides. Now, most people are familiar with our annual sunflower, Helianthus annuus. This is a perennial version. And indeed, it can get to be six to seven feet tall. And as soon as you see that, don't think it's going to stay up on its own <laughs> because this is not nature. This is not the wilderness, which doesn't care if the plant is on its side. We do care. So I've got mine growing on the north side of a, a, a dwarf, uh, fully dwarfed growing apple tree. So this year I've been trying to step it down little by little. And um, this year I'm, I'm going to take it down by 50 percent in in June. It, it'll it'll come on, it'll flower again, but I'm hoping to wind up with a five-foot plant that's rigid. We try to stay away from the bamboo stakes and the green string ties and all that stuff. It's really a little bit amateurish. I've done it. We've all done it. When you when when it's time to say, whoops, I should have done something else in June. It's now August. You got to keep the plant upright. Fine. Um, but if you have a little bit of plant savvy behind you and Tracy, in her book, The Well-Tended Perennial Garden, will supply all of that for you. Just follow her instructions. You're going to look a whole lot better. Um, Gowardia aristotata, blanket flower, just threw that in because it's a gimme. You know, it's it's kind of sort of a native out here. It's uh, found east of the hills and into the Rocky Mountains. But uh, it's just a durable plant, blanket flower. It does a great job. And, again, if you remember, it's one of those ones you could raise from seed uh, for uh, uh, very little money. Leatris spicata. Um, <laughs> if you do raise this from seed, uh, this is a, a blazing star, I think is the common name for it. Uh -huh. um, it's also, very surprisingly, in the aster family. And you'd never guess it looking at the flower. Yeah, that is weird. It grows as a spike. It grows as a spike. The spike is cymos, which means it flowers from the top and works its way down that stem. Stunning plant. Don't be scared. It won't flower for about three years if raised from seed. But that's okay. Just get it out into the mix. Uh, and, again, you can cut the basal foliage down to the ground once the flowers are spent and very well may fire again. Uh, Inula and Sifolia, um, Ella Campaign is the common name. Dramatically large plant. Uh Definitely a back of the border sort of thing, but if we're looking for something dramatic with, you know, eight, 10, 12 inch long uh, leaves and then uh, flowers are probably about four to six inches in diameter. Really cool plant. And I, I, I made note here, there is a, a cultivar called Compacta. So I'm assuming that is hopefully half its size. A uh, Sylphium atum. This is one of those Midwestern plants. It's the, um, um, cup plant, or uh, I can't recall the other version's name off the top of my head. Compass plant, compass plant, because the leaves orient themselves north to south. Again, this is one of the ones that caught my attention. This is seven feet tall, and you really want to break up those uh, garden patches a little bit with something really dramatic. And if you don't have something really dramatic, I don't have the time to grow something that's woody. Well, my goodness, there are. Um, a wide array of annuals. This is just one of them. That will get that tall, okay? Uh, I'm sorry, it's a perennial, uh, but we'll get that tall. Maybe not the first year, definitely the second one. Seven foot tall, yellow yellow flowers of summer. You know, once you start getting the wheels going, it's like, oh, well, maybe I can cut that back. And if it's not in Tracy's book, try it. The worst that's going to happen is that something may not flower that season at all. But then, then you'll know. A root Becky and Nidida herb, herb stona. Um, um, we all familiar with root, root Beckia, you know, Gloriosa. There's annual varieties. There are uh, perennial ones. Uh, this is a seven foot tall element. And we grew, are growing one on campus. Oh, I uh, saw it is, this year. Yeah, it's huge. It is. Um, it doesn't have uh, petals, though. Maxima. Okay. Yeah. Maxima. Um, it's just a big version of it, kind of leathery strap, strap shaped leaves, and it puts out a cone. You, you get to understand why they call it a cone flower. It's just really a huge pronounced cone 
on the top with the ray petals surrounding it. A uh, beautiful plant. Wow. Uh, again, you cut it back by half in June for a five foot plant so it doesn't flop over. The maxima we've been using, no flopping. So, try, you know, try it. Try it without doing anything the first year. If it doesn't do what you need it to do because we are looking for an orderly frame for our messy construct, well, then try pruning it back a little bit. And the last one I have is Helenium autumn nolly. Uh, this is um, uh, sneezeweed, um, and it's late flowering, which is why I love it. And um, you can make it flower later. That's another advantage of pruning things back. So it can be pinched to control height, remove four to six inches when in, when in tight bud, when in tight bud. So now you're not just – Coming across, wait till it buds up, take a four to six inches because Tracy admonishes you if you cut it back by half in June before it gets a tight bud, it just may not flower that season. Oh, okay. So uh, we're going to wait gotcha. till some tight bud. And if you cut it back by four to six inches at that point, it'll flower two weeks later. And this opens up a whole raft of other culturally appreciated phenomena. Well, maybe I've got two plants. That flower sings synchronously, there's some synchronicity in terms of the flowering time, but I hate the color combination. Well, you just prune one back and delay the flowering of it yeah, by right. two or three weeks, and mm-hmm. then you've got your pink without your orange. Not that that's the most horrible combination in the world, but it is one people are told to stay away from. Well, I'm here to tell you, mix and match any color combination you want. But there's a lot to be learned by understanding how to manage plants. And again, that well-tended perennial garden book is worth its weight in gold. Well, well, and Doni, that's kind of what I had in terms of the presentation. Um, I could go on if you like. Or that's great, Al. I, I um, th- thanks so much for covering all of this. I, I have to listen to this episode maybe four times, and I. I, I am, I'm pitying the transcriber who's going to have to kind of like pull all those names out, but it's uh thank you so much for setting us up for a great uh, year. I'm looking forward to starting my seeds uh, um, yeah. and getting a ra- getting some cool plants in my garden without spending a whole lot of money. That's I like that. Yeah, no, I, I think that, that, I mean, with the seed craze that's going on now, people grabbing everything they can. I don't think they realize how easy it is if you just wait till mid June and do it outside. Um, I'm glad you're having a wide array of different speakers on there. I think that's critical. Um, just you know, as an admonition to homeowners, do your homework. Don't listen to one or two people. Listen to ten people, and distill from those ten people what strikes you as meaningful. Get online, look things up, and 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 just do your own homework. It is so easy to be professional in this day and age because the resources are out there they're abundant well and, and it's good because i think uh, we have a show coming up with dancing oaks they're going to be on the show oh god leonard and fred are absolutely phenomenal and it's been horrible i didn't get to visit with them uh leonard fred's usually at work his day job is a doctor a uh, medical doctor and um leonard is running the nursery but um uh definitely looking forward to getting out there this this season and the beauty of that for those of you listening who are who are within, you know, range of Corvallis and OSU, these guys are, you know, outside of Monmouth, they're, they're about a 30 minute drive. So you have a Portland quality, high end, super selective nursery, 30 minutes away from us in Corvallis. It's, it's worth its weight in gold. It really is. So that's super. Yeah. Listen to people like this because they planted and they've grown and they know what makes it out here. So that's just great. And I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing that one myself. Well, stay tuned, everybody, and thanks so much for your time, Al, and I can't wait to see you in the hallway again, hopefully sooner rather than later. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, you bet. Same here. (laughs) Take care of yourself, Andoni. Thanks a lot for the opportunity to share. Thank you so much for listening. The show is produced by Quinn Sin and Neil, who's a student here at OSU in the New Media Communications Program. And the show wouldn't even be possible without the support of the Oregon Legislature, the Foundation for Food and Agricultural Research, and Western SARE. Show notes with links mentioned on each episode are available on the website, which is at pollinationpodcast.oregonstate.edu. I also love hearing from you, and there's several ways to connect with me. The first one is you can visit the website and leave an episode-specific comment. You can suggest a future guest or topic or ask a question that could be featured in a future episode. But you can do the same things on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook by visiting the Oregon Bee Project. Thanks so much for listening, and see you next week.